welcome to this meeting of the Black Isle Area Committee. Please note that this meeting will be recorded and thereafter archived for public access via the Highland Council's YouTube channel. So welcome one and all. Um, so if we can start off, I don't think we've got any apologies for absence today, do we? Um, so is no. So are there any declarations of interest? I don't have any myself, no. Brilliant. OK, so the committee is asked to note um, for number three under recess powers um, that they did not require to be accessed following the meeting of the council on the 29th of June. So is that noted? Great. OK, so I see that we've got Inspector Richard Ross with us, so welcome. It's nice to see you again. Um, would you like to talk to the police report now? Yes, no problem, Chair. Uh, my intention would be to run through the report and then take questions at the end, if that's suitable for yourself. Um, so my intention is not to run through every line of the report, but just to highlight the, the key points. So uh, probably what you will have noticed is the report is in the, that, uh, different name, different chief inspector. So Scott MacDonald retired a couple of months ago uh, and has been replaced by Acting Chief Inspector Stuart Fitzpatrick. Unfortunately, he's uh, unable to be here today. He's other uh, meetings he is at. Um, his introduction is documented in the in the uh, document. I don't plan to run through that. In terms of local policing priorities, uh, they remain as road safety and road crime anti-social behaviour, violence and disorder, acquisitive crime, protecting vulnerable people, serious and organised crime and terrorism and public order. Looking at the Black Isle at a glance section, um, in terms of road safety and road crime, um, you see that overall there has been an increase in road crime against the five year and the last year to date figures. Mobile telephone offences have increased um, again against the five year and the last year today, and failed to ensure against uh, third party risks has also increased by against both measures. I'll go on to talk about each priority in more detail, but I would have anticipated a rise in road crime as we've moved out of restrictions, more of movement, uh, people on the go. Road safety and road crime is in general an indication of proactive policing, that is uh, being out there uh, detecting offences rather than stuff that's being reported to us. So that's an indication of the proactivity of road policing officers and local officers. In terms of antisocial behaviour, disorder and violence, um, overall antisocial behaviour has increased against the, the five year and the last year to date. Um, unfortunately, common assaults have also increased against both measures. But it's pleasing to see that there has been uh, you know, a, a significant decrease in the five year and in the last year today in terms of serious assaults for the for the area. Um, in terms of acquisitive crime, um, overall acquisitive crime has increased against the five year and the last year to date. Figures, uh, housebreaking has increased against the five year and uh, the last year to date and fraud offences have increased against the five year average but have stayed static compared to the last year to date. And I'll go on to talk more about fraud offences uh, later on in the document. In terms of protecting vulnerable people, uh, sexual crime has increased against the five year and the last year to date as has domestic related offences. Heat crime has dropped in relation to both measures. In terms of serious and organised crime, there has been an increase in uh, supply of drugs offences with the um, two crimes detected over the, the last year. Again, that's uh, serious and organised crime detection is proactive policing rather than reactive. Um, there is a section on counter-terrorism and domestic extremism. Um, we don't provide data in relation to that. It's more regarding preventative work, and there's a further section detailed in the report. In terms of the statistics, what I would highlight is 
In terms of the five-year and three-year averages, we are still seeing the effects of COVID lockdown uh, where there was much lower figures. So we will see increases as people have returned to uh, normal uh, ways of life and normal going about their business. Uh, so I think we will take a number of years to see figures sell out um, following, following the lockdown. To go into the each priority in more detail. So in terms of uh, road safety and road crimes, the first section, it's pleasing to see then uh, the year under review, uh, there was no fatal road accidents uh, within the area, which is a reduction of three in the previous year. There has been an increase in drink or drug driving offences being detected. And again, that's uh, an indication of the proactivity of road policing and uh, response officers uh, and speeding offences. There's a, a very slight reduction in the year to date of two offences. And so it's a very slight compared to the, the 106 that were detected. In terms of road policing, we continue to use Operation Cedar as our um, method of tackling road crime, which is to challenge, educate, detect and reduce. That is led by our road policing colleagues but supported by local officers. As part of that, there is uh, multi-agency operations and also a calendar of uh, enforcement activity targeting various areas throughout the year. Um, in terms of anti-social behaviour, disorder and violence, again, please see there was uh, no murders within the area in the last year. Assaults, as I said, have increased, slight increase, an increase of two from the last year to date, um, and a reduction in serious assaults, data down to no serious assaults within the last year in the Black Isle area. Drugs possession offences have decreased slightly, 19 de detections compared to 24 of the previous year. In terms of the harm prevention officer, we still have the harm prevention officer role, which is based in police headquarters. This is a post funded by the NHS and the Highlands Alcohol and Drug Partnership and is there to work with our partners uh, to support others, uh, people who may be vulnerable uh, to Kukui and County Lines activity and support them. So that, that post continues. And whilst based in um, Inverness in our headquarters, is a divisional role and does support into the Black Isle area. Um, there's a, a section on no lives, better lives. I don't intend to read that. It's there for, for reading, but we do uh, continue to work with schools in terms of uh, knife crime. For acquisitive crime, in terms of housebreaking, there was an increase on uh, dwelling house housebreaking. There was an increase in, of two compared to none the previous year. Frauds have stayed static at 16, but that is uh, higher than the five and five year and three year averages. What I would say is that is a national trend. Uh, you notice the detection rate is quite low. That is because the vast majority of fraud offences uh, occur out with the UK. They are either by internet or telephone scams. Um, so extremely difficult for us to detect within the United Kingdom when they've occurred out with. Uh, and we would look to transfer that through various agencies to the respective countries. But that's why it's a very difficult crime for us to detect, but we do a lot of work in terms of prevention. Um, theft by shopliftings have decreased. Uh, they've halved in the, uh, compared to the previous year. And vehicle crime has also reduced from four the previous year to one uh, this year. Um, so we've covered fraud. In terms of banking protocol, we continue to use that, um, working with our financial institutes throughout the area. That is in the main to detect uh, lifetime offences where people have been asked to turn up at banks and either transfer large sums of money or uh, take money out. Where the bank feels that it's suspicious, they will report to us if they feel the person's vulnerable. Uh, and that continues to work well in our area. And we... Uh, on an annual basis, we review review that and work with the banks to ensure the staff are kept up to date. Again, there's a section on Rural Watch. I won't go into it in any detail, but 
I would request that you consider signing up for Rural Watch, which gives you information on crimes. Moving on to protecting vulnerable people, uh, you will know there has been a, a slight increase in sexual crime reported to us um, within the last year. Uh, domestic crime, there has been a, an increase of seven and aid crime has reduced to zero aid crimes within the area. Um, in terms of missing people, you'll see there's a reduction of eight. Um, what was this? These figures are not to your area. They are divisional. We can't take the the figures down to um, to ward level for missing people. But you will see, if looking further into the detail, there's a reduction in cared for adults and looked after. A significant reduction in looked after children being reported missing. As context for the Black Isle area, in terms of looked after children within the home, we have noticed a significant reduction in incidents of children being reported missing from these homes. We continue to have our uh, liaison officer link in with the homes to try and reduce the number of these incidents. So, and we'll carry that on through the next year. But as he has a local context, we are noticing that reduction. Uh, which is good because obviously missing people places a significant demand on police resources and time. In terms of serious and organised crime, uh, drug supply offences have increased on the five year average and uh, stayed static in terms of the last year today. Again, I would have expected a rise on the five and three year average because during COVID times we were not. Uh, as proactive in terms of uh, warrant enforcement uh, addresses for obvious health reasons for uh, for uh, both occupants and officers. In terms of county lines activities, uh, there's a section on it there. What I would say is we can't be complacent. The area is still vulnerable to county line activity. As a division, we have the Divisional Organised Crime Team, uh, which is based within the Inverness area, but covers the entire division um, continuing to target these groups. But again, we can't, can't become complacent and they will target our area. In terms of counterterrorism, we don't provide statistics in relation to counterterrorism. It's in relation to preventative work. And there's a section there from our counterterrorism liaison officer to be read. I don't intend to go over that in any detail. The back of the report has further crime statistics. I don't tend to go through that. They're there to read, but I'm happy to take questions in relation to that. The last section I wish to cover is uh, you will be aware there is challenges lying ahead for policing in the area as a result of the well-documented reduction in police uh, finances and resources. Um, obviously, as it's been documented that we've had to lose posts uh, throughout Police Scotland. We are looking at uh, how to backfill uh, gaps. And we're also doing that in a climate of reduced ability to uh, use overtime. So there is challenges in terms of financing. We are looking at that and looking at a more fluid deployment model, uh, calling upon neighbouring area commands at times of need to keep the level of staffing consistent. So we are working alongside our other area commands and specialist departments to ensure a consistent level of resourcing. That is not to say there will not be challenging times ahead in terms of the uh, budgetary position of Police Scotland. Um, I believe the councillors are going to be briefed further on that by our Chief Superintendent shortly, so I don't intend to go into further detail in relation to that, but to say we are working uh, to, to ensure services are maintained, but there will be challenging times ahead. Um, other than that, Chair, that's all I would wish to say. Uh, happy to open up to questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your report, Inspector Ross. Really appreciate it. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Um, we we all have a few questions. Um, I know yes. that. So perhaps if we we go round and we give you all of our questions in one go, and then you can perhaps answer us each, um, with all of our questions. So, okay. um, if I start off with, um, obviously you know you were talking about the the speeding figures, 
um, and that there's been a slight reduction in speeding. Do you think that the rollout of the new 20 mile an hour um, zones that's happening, obviously, across the Highlands, um, do you see that as having um, an impact on changing driver behaviour and, and perhaps do you see that as reducing speeding offences or do you think the, the opposite will be true, just out of interest? Because um, obviously we would be keen to see our, our roads safer um, for, for all road users and pedestrians alike. Um, and I was quite saddened to see that obviously the increase in drink and, drink and drug driving offences. Um, I think that's disappointing and obviously goes against what everybody would hope for. Um, on on that though, um, when we were looking at the figures, the other couple of questions I had was that um, I noticed that there was um, a 0% detection rate for the break-ins and I was just wondering how how you see that going forward if there is going to be a reduction in, in policing and resources and um, obviously I understand that policing changes and it's not the same as, you know, what people perhaps have perceptions of, you know, police officers walking two by two down the street all the time and that we, things are investigated has moved on and changed. Um, but obviously, as there's pressure on your service, how do you see these crimes being resolved going forward? And in terms of the, the missing people, um, it, I, I you know, I'm delighted that there has been less missing people overall, but do you find that when it comes to missing adults, is it mostly missing adults who maybe have a, a dementia type condition or is it people who are not wanting to be found that you find in general? Um, so if you could if you could go through those and then we'll pass on to the, the next number. No problem. Um, so in terms of the 20 mile an hour speed limit signs, um, the intention of the 20 mile hours is about changing driver behaviour. It's not specifically based on enforcement activity. Uh, it's about a change in culture. Um, a bit like the, you know, the change in culture in terms of seatbelts, drink driving over the years. This is about, so it's about education. We will naturally see a reduction in speeds just by having the 20 mile an hour zones there. Where there is specific issues in terms of some of the 20 mile zones, particularly around schools, um, if required, we will uh, take enforcement action. But in the main, the council's policy in terms of 20 mile is about changes in drivers' behaviour. Um, in terms of the increase in drink and drug driving, uh, first of all, I would say it's disappointing to see there is still people willing to take that risk. But on the other hand, it's pleasing to see that members of the public are willing to report it to us. Uh, and it's also pleasing to see that, uh, you know, the proactive approach to detect that. So, yes, it's disappointing to see people are still willing to, to take that risk with theirs and other people's safety. But I say there is positives about uh, the willingness of and the, how, how unsocially acceptable it is that people will report it to us. Uh, in terms of the 0% detection for break-ins and resourcing without effect that, break-ins to dwelling houses will always be a priority for us uh, to respond to. Um, that's, you know, that will not change in terms of any challenges that the police service may have. What I would say is for break-ins, um, they quite often can't take a time to detect, particularly if they have gone to do forensic work that can take some time. So you quite often will see offences detected some time after um, they have been reported to us, depending on what forensic work is having to be done, just the way the labs work and timescales to get stuff back. So uh, in terms of that, the numbers are still low. You know, there was two within a year. And we're talking low numbers in the Black Isle. Um, I don't see it as a trend or anything to be overly concerned about at uh, present, but we will continue to have that as a priority. In terms of missing people, you asked whether dementia is a primary cause for adults going missing. I would say no, it's actually the lower end of the scale. Uh, I would suggest it is more people who are in crisis or there's something 
here. They've got a reason to to go missing, to take themselves away for a period of time. But no, I would say dementia. We we do all work. If we do have uh, dementia sufferer who goes missing, there is work we can do in terms of uh, supporting the family with various um, methods to protect that and one reduce the chances, but also increase the the speed by which we can find the person. So there is work that goes in around dementia sufferers, but it's probably the lower end of the scale. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, uh, who, um, Sarah or Marva May, who fancies their questions next? I don't mind going in. Sarah's happy. Go on then. <laughs> Sorry, I'm on um, So, oh, sorry, are you going, Sarah? No, no you go, you go. Because right. we're probably going to cross over actually on since so we'll see. <laughs> you go first and then we, then we won't. Perfect. Um, so I was quite interested to know a little bit more about the um, sexual offences. Um, obviously, any sexual offence is incredibly serious, but that term encases quite a lot of different scenarios. So I was just wondering on what scale are we talking about? Are we talking about very, very serious sexual offences or are we talking about middle grade? I'm, I'm just kind of curious as to what that figure actually encompasses. Um, and my next question was actually on stalking because I noticed that there was an increase and I was just curious to know what people can actually do in order to try and protect themselves, what they should do if they feel that they're being stalked, just so that if we have people coming to us looking for advice and support, we can give them the best and most accurate information. And that was that was my main question. That's OK, so, <laughs> uh, so the first one, I, I don't have the actual breakdown of exactly what offences um would be covered by sexual crime but it would range i i would never want to you know describe one as serious and not serious they're all mm -hmm. serious uh, you know have the sexual crime um but it encompasses a wide range of offending types what i would say with a uh, sexual crime figures is the public are now more willing to come to the police and re report historical matters uh, that have have happened. We get a lot of historical reports to us, um, which then can make it look like there's been an increase now, but actually the offending may have been uh, many, many years ago, rather than uh, within the last year. But it's when the offence is reported to us, it appears in the, the figures. So in terms of the, the sex offences, um, the thing we do is quite often inquiries, uh, particularly if it's domestic related, can result in numerous crimes if it's been something's been happening over a, a period of time. So each individual crime is recorded. That's not victims, that is a, each individual instance. Um, so it could be, you know, if somebody's reported a, a catalogue of abuse over years, it may result in, you know, a large number of crimes being recorded. So the figures without going into very specific details um, would be difficult to interpret. But what it says, there's, you know, there's, I wouldn't be concerned about what you're seeing there. That's fairly, fairly um, understandable and explainable. Okay, thank you for yeah. that. In terms of stalking, uh, you've asked what people could do. If somebody believes they're being stalking, the first thing I would say is they report it to the police so that we can um, deal with it. We can also look at safety planning. We have, uh, numerous methods by which we can look at safety planning and safety advice to people and also look to uh, detect or deter person from further activity. OK, and okay. can I ask a little bit more on that? What would you categorise as stalking so that people can can know? Because I know a lot of people perhaps are, are being stalked and don't actually realise that that is what they are experiencing because they're maybe downplaying it in their own mind. So for us to have a better idea of whether or not we should be saying to people, no, you need to go to the police at this stage. Could you give us a bit more information around that? So it's actually, it's quite a difficult offence to completely define as to what would be stalking because it's actually quite wide ranging. Mm -hmm. It's a wide ranging offence what stalking can be. It can be online, it can be in person, it can be by gifts being sent, it can be by getting another party to, uh, another person, third party to stalk somebody on their behalf. You know, it is so wide ranging. What I would say is if somebody feels 
that they are being stalked, they should report it to us to allow us to assess whether it's criminal. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we could go into the, the finer details of what what they're experiencing, what they feel that they're experiencing, and we can look as to whether it meets the threshold of criminality. And if it doesn't, there is still work we can do in terms of safety planning and advice to them um, to reduce it or to actually go and speak to the person and to prevent further offences. OK, thank you very much for that. Okay. Thank you. And Sarah, would you like to pose your questions? Yeah, and apologies for the interruption. Even though there's a notice on the door, never mind. Um, <laughs> I have quite a few, Richard. Are you ready? For, are you ready for that? Yes. Well, firstly, thanks so much for the report. Is uh, I love the clarity. You know the kind of graphs and everything. It's great. You know, really, really well done. Um, firstly, on we get a lot of emails about antisocial behaviour, but the low, the low level stuff has such an has such an impact on communities and and individual lives and mental health. Is are these are these obviously these are reported in, uh, instances? Is there a? I mean, quite often it's communities themselves that need to feel a little bit empowered with neighbourhoods, neighbourhood watch kind of things, tenant associations. Is is there a kind of proactive strategic approach to to certain kind of might be hot spots or might just be persistent calls, say from a particular street to so people feel not to, they they feel it's worth reporting and they're not too scared to report. That's my first question. On um on the driving offences, this again the CEDA program is that once people have committed the offence, or is it a general educational uh, strategy? And no lives better lives. I mean, quite often national national strategies are on the back of new you know particular problems in bigger cities etc with knife crime how how prevalent is knife crime in our in the highlands in our area i mean we don't want any anybody going around with a knife but i know that in london it's actually it's, it's huge but i don't know you know in perspective how whether that relates to our to where we live and and obviously county lines is hugely worrying. Um, we hear a lot, but it's all anecdote about, and again, some sense of whether people go, oh, that could never happen here. The sense of the seriousness of it and the, the prevalence of it in, in our communities and the vulnerability of our young people. And obviously you're going into schools as well as uh, producing a pack to really, really warn kids, because again, it will be the kids that are brave enough to say, I'm worried about my friend, they're vulnerable. And on the similar on the similar theme with young people on the prevent, I mean, there is a big problem with um, Andrew Tate style, what I would consider radicalisation. I don't know if the police would consider, you know, this kind of misogyny, um, very ha women hating and, and vulnerable young men kind of it captured by a lot of this online stuff. I don't know if that's part of the programme or whether that's a separate, that would be considered a separate issue. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm just reading down the notes. So uh, the first one in terms of antisocial behaviour, yes, low level antisocial behaviour can have a negative effect on communities and specific people. Um, at a strategic level, uh, which I think was the question, we work with our local uh, local authority and also numerous partner agencies. Um, we do that through a group called Safer Ross, where we will look at incidents that have been reported to the police and we will identify whether there is a work that can be done to reduce these incidents. If it relates to specific properties, we will look at whether it's uh, privately or privately owned or rented through local authority housing association. And if that is the case, the council and the social behaviour officer will take work forward in terms of acceptable behaviour contracts um, or um, 
you know, advice to the tenants to try and reduce the incidents. So we are uh, strategic on partnership level working to reduce our initial behaviour. But what I would say is if there's concerns in the community, we need to know about it. We need it to be reported to us so we can deal with it. Uh, we can't deal with it if we're not informed. Uh, in terms of driving and operation CEDAR, no, it's not a case of just educating once somebody is detected. That is our CEDAR is our overall strategy for how we deal with road crime. As part of that, we have uh, various forms of education uh, and preventative work throughout the year uh, and through various means, whether that be social media or in-person presentations. So there's quite a lot of work done in terms of prevention. Uh, prevention and education contain numerous forms, um, but it's not just um, you know, by issuing tickets and educating them then as um, about trying to prevent it in the first place. Uh, the next one was no knives spare lives. Uh, you asked how prevalent knife is. Specifically on the Black Isle, I would say uh, not. I mean, more strategically for hi the Highland. The Highland. Area. So, yeah. in terms of, yes, there is issues with knife crime, as in all areas. Um, no, I don't think we have the same levels or issues that other areas have, but we do have people who are willing to carry knives in our area, uh, and we need to target them. Uh, in terms of enforcement, but also prevention. The reason we uh, do no knives spare lives is we try and start early on with the education that uh, carrying knives is unacceptable uh, and the consequences for uh, victims and also perpetrators if should they carry a knife and use it. So that is why we start that early on. Um, in terms of county lines, you talked about anecdotal information. Mm -hmm. uh, I would suggest anecdotal possibly is, um, you know, if people have concerns that should be reported to us. Uh, it may appear anecdotal, but it may also just be a bit of information we need. It could be intelligence. Um, you, you talked about the prevalence of county lines activity. Um, this area continues to be uh, susceptible to county lines activity. We continue to detect county lines and we know that it goes on. So we need uh, everyone, whether that be the community, partner agencies, police officers, to be open minded to the fact it occurs and if they are concerned to report that concerns and we can look at it. You talked about schools and whether we educate. I would say in terms of county lines, that doesn't, you know, school people don't tend to be the the targets of that, what you will tend to have is, uh, in terms of county lines or cocooning, vulnerable um, drug users who may have their home taken over. So it's it's not, I'm not saying school children are never part of that, they are, but it uh, tends more to be uh, drug users who are in crisis and who are vulnerable to being uh, taken advantage of by these groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, but should you wish more informational care lines, I can get more information to the councillors mm -hmm. and get input on that to you. Uh, in terms of prevent strategy, the prevent strategy is specific to counterterrorism. It does not relate to uh, misogyny. Uh, in terms of misogyny, that would come under police call and strategy in relation to violence against women and girls. Uh, so there is a strategy in relation to that. Um, but that would not come under prevent. That's a completely separate work stream. Thank you. I think I've answered all the questions. Thank you so much for your time today, Richard. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for taking time to answer all our questions uh, so diligently. Thank you very much. No problem at all. I'll leave you to now then. Thanks. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye for now. Thanks. OK. So we're moving on to item number five. Um, so this is really just for noting. Um, we have the nine um, grants that were paid out from the Ward Discretionary Fund since the 31st of January. So just for noting. 
And then we have the Black Isle, uh, number six, the Black Isle, um, the, the capital programme for the housing revenue account. Um, oh, sorry, Sarah. I just wondered if this was a good, previous item was a good point, good time to raise the the Royal Discretionary Fund and oh, a sli our slightly different right. approach to awarding funds just so it's because it's on camera and official and i'd written that down and i'd done skipping over it really <laughs> so yes um it, the the point that we want to note on the uh the the funding for the discretionary budget for the board is that um we made a decision at our last business meeting that we're only going to accept um, applications which are now a thousand pounds and under due to the limited resources left in that fund um so yeah thank you for reminding me Sarah that <laughs> I really appreciate it yes so um the the Black Isle um the housing revenue account capital program um so um yes I, I take it we're going to get um a report on this from yourselves Brian and Jonathan so um, I'll hand over to you just now. I'll, I'll delegate this chair to, to Jonathan. He's the expert, so I'll let him carry on. <laughs> Sorry, John. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Very kind. Um, good Good morning, members. Uh, I've uh, The report in front of you just, I suppose, um, takes forward the discussion that we've had at Ward Business previously. And there's just a few things I'd like to highlight within the report. And then obviously I'm happy to take any questions. And then if any further detail is required, I can obviously come back to Word Business in due course. So section five just gives a, a brief update on the on the current year programme and uh, just follows on from discussion that there was at Strategic Committee um, last week. Um, section 6.6 .6 outlines the budget allocation um, for the four years from 23 to 27 for the, the Black Hill area. 6.9 really is just the, the the identification of what the priority needs to be and and I suppose what we're recommending is a priority in respect of energy efficiency works across our stock and members will see in appendix one uh, that that priority um, evidenced in the the percentage of spend that we're intending against the the energy efficiency line within the within the four year budget so um, just just a brief introduction there members and and, and happy to take any questions or comments thank you Thank you very much. Um, so I just want to say um, thank you very much for the figures. It's encouraging to see the the improvements that are made to the um, the housing within the Black Isle and um, really appreciate the works that are going on, especially in terms of energy efficiency, given there's such a, you know, a pressure on people's finances at the moment that keeping houses warm is obviously a major concern for people. Um, so yes, really appreciate that. And I also really appreciate the information regarding people being able to get adaptions and modifications to their homes when required for, for various conditions. So I really appreciate that information and thank you. Um, Sarah, you had questions on this one, didn't you? A couple. Um, I just, I'm also on the Climate Change Committee and I, I was reading through the paper, through obviously through the paper, and I just remembered on the on the net zero strategy, the approach to the energy efficiency is a you know the fabric first approach. So is that in conflict with? Because I mean, basically, you look at a property. This is how I read it. I might be wrong. You look at a property and you think we'll put more efficient heating in, but actually we better check the windows and the doors aren't drafty and so that the heating isn't just not resolving the problem because people are still cogs because there's drafts coming through the windows. Is that is the net is the net zero strategy approach at, at odds with with this? Just with the energy efficiency prioritising heating? Just to be, is that clear as mud? No, <laughs> that, a that's, a, that's a, a fair question, Councillor Atkins. So um, I think we do intend to take a fabric first approach in terms of the improvements that we make um, looking at insulation measures windows and doors um, because as you say um, a replacement heating system in and itself might not necessarily deliver the improvement that we would that we would look for what I, what I would say about the Black Isle program specifically 
Um, and I think we did discuss this at, at War Business, uh, my memory is telling me, that the maintenance officer for the local area has identified a number of uh, older um, windows and doors that, that, that are going to need replacement. So my feeling is that the probably the, the programme itself, the detail of that will be more so um, weighted towards um, Fabric First approach windows and doors, that type of thing. But um, I can certainly come back to Ward Business in due course when we've got the specific detail um, of the programme um, and we can we can share that. And just my second question. When the um, this was approved, agreement 4.1 was 2021, obviously before any of us were elected and that the landscape has changed immeasurably, hasn't it? The, the financial pressures on the programme. I mean, presumably, you vote on the programme and it, it can't just kind of stay as it is, but I appreciate you've got to have a kind of plan. But, you know, just to say we're, we're all aware of the financial pressures that the service is under. Um, so we can't just kind of say 20, we voted for this plan and it has to happen because financial pressures will might make make some of it not able to happen. What, what's your view on that, please? Um, thanks, Councillor Atkin. Yeah, the, the, I suppose the financial pressure that, um, that everybody's under is a is a challenge for the for the HRA capital program. But what we've what we try to do is try and deliver that program as efficiently as we can. Um, so taking advantage of perhaps contracts which exist in other areas, and and, and looking to sort of deliver. Um, you know, for instance, Black Isle program on a on a different contract to deliver efficiencies and and economies of scale. Um, that that said, costs are, have gone up, um, and you're absolutely right that um, when the the original five year plan was um, was put together, um, that the landscape was quite was quite difficult, and we found ourselves having to adapt to that. You know, over the course of the last wee while, um, I think what we're what we're also trying to do um, always, um, and and more so in these circumstances, is look at what options there are in terms of external funding to support our investment as well, um, to stretch stretch the the resources that we've got further still. So so that work is ongoing, um, and we work quite closely with our colleagues in the energy team um, to try and to try and look at those external options which are available to us. Thank you. Uh, if I can just come in, Councillor, I can again just to echo what Jonathan said there. It's likely we'll probably have to go back to Strategic Housing and Property Committee with an updated uh, financial plan in due course, because I, I, as you say, over the course of five years, a lot of things can happen as such. And uh, some of this is down, it's going to be a timing issue. So some of it will depend, uh, as you say, on what what the decisions made at climate change committee will be and some of the direction there and uh, what support it might be available externally uh, for the for the housing revenue account capital program some of it will relate to our revenue estimates which will go to january committee so that's basically what the rent uh, levels will look like for 2024-25 um, what i've been doing over the summer is uh, jonathan's put a lot of work into this as well in terms of planning out the next 30 years in terms of future investment needs, what the future net zero investment needs might be, but also working with our colleagues in finance to work out how afford affordable this all is, because um, there's going to be a huge impact that the more we spend on capital projects, the more we have to borrow in terms of that. And it's just what impact that will have and the loan charges moving on and how we can keep rents affordable and mm. over the coming years as such but still invest heavily in, in our house and stock for our tenants. So ex, I, I don't have a time for it right now, but there will be a, an updated capital programme going to Housing and Property Committee probably within this financial year, I would imagine. So I'll, um, the, the, the next committee is in November as such. So yeah. I don't think there'll be anything ready in time for that. And it, my, my personal preference is we wait for the government announcement in terms of the energy efficiency standard. They've promised in the last two weeks that they'll have that completed by the end of uh, uh, December 2023. I think it's really important to find out what standards the government want us to reach for the future before we, we, we commit to a, a longer term programme. So hopefully that's a bit of an update for you. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. It's great. That's me done, Chair.
Brilliant. And Marva May, did you have questions regarding this topic? Um, my questions have been answered already, so that's perfect for me. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan and Brian, for coming along today. Really appreciate you taking the time out and passing on that information. So, um, so take it. We're we're happy to note the contents of the report, note the updates, um, and note the agreed proposal for the investment priorities. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Very yes. Okay, so we're now moving on to item seven, which is the the winter service plan. Um, do we have Ian with us? Good morning, councillors. Hello there. Lovely Hi. to see you. Good morning. Good morning. So obviously, thank you very much for passing on the the information, which, um, you know, I'm sure we we've all um realised how familiar it looks and very much similar to what happened last year. So, um, are you wanting to talk to Atalian or how do you um, want well, to proceed? It's... As you said, Councillor uh, uh, Johnson, it's the same same report uh, as last year, the same routes, same men and ritters. So uh, I can go through this um, in, in depth if you want, or we can proceed straight to questions and answers. Shall we just go straight to questions and answers? Yeah, yeah I'm fine with that. Okay. Um, uh, one of the questions I had for you was, um, I know that you said in the the information that the grit sand bins are filled early in the season on the high difficult to access routes where people may get stuck. Um, if members of the public notice that these bins are perhaps running low or empty, um, do they get refilled on request? That was really my main question. Um, regarding this because uh, and to really to thank the team um all working out at Green Hill that uh, um you know really appreciate the work that happens and you know with their limited resource and small team what a great job they do. Um yeah thanks for that. I'll certainly pass that on to our guys at Green Hill. Uh, uh you've it's difficult to underestimate how much that means to the guys whether it's winter or um or the capital works the um uh in this day and age of social media we seem to be under the fire constantly so i know they'll appreciate your compliments thanks in terms of the grip bins filled at the start of the season we um we do fill them up to the start of the season and then we'll fill them up uh uh with the the footpath tractors refill restock their their hopper from the grip bins and um, but the footpath tractors can't obviously they need to have salt in it so we we have to then go around and load them up uh reload them but um <coughs> if any member of the public wants to um to come back uh, to say that any particular bin's empty then we'll certainly take that uh on board please yeah and um uh they, they are refilled as resources permit uh but, but clearly we don't want to leave them empty you know for any, any length of time no fantastic um sarah you had questions i think a, a couple of questions ian i'm i'm 6.1, I'm fascinated by a the council of employing a professional weather forecaster. Is this a meteorologist or how does that how does that work? You know, I just think that anyone yeah. watching would be quite interested to know because they they think with the Met Office and et cetera, that it would be a kind of weird thing to a weird thing for the council to hire somebody for that purpose. But there must be a reason locally. Um, and my second question, I mean, again, worth reminding anybody watching, six gritters and five footpath tractors. Yeah, that's not a lot for the area that's that's being covered. 
um and it's a you know it's an enormous huge amount of work that's done and i'm going back to the weather forecast i mean could anybody predict it last winter you know the the stress and pressure you're under so the, the kind of connected two questions really yeah um the forecasting side of it is kind of interesting um any any uh you could say energy or transport related companies now have their own forecasters for winter um you think about the airports yeah you think about network rail uh the trunk road uh we're we're no different to that we use um met desk currently who are i believe the tenders coming up for renewal but we've used met desk for the last two or three years <laughs> and quite often um if you watch any of the big sporting events uh in particular any of the sailing events you quite often see um weather information supplied by whoever it is um uh, what we have is with a contract with MetDesk is that we have a number of sensors in our mode that record um, the, the surface temperature, the deep temperature in the ground, uh, the humidity, uh, the, um, uh, the air temperature, and that's used to that's plotted into the uh, forecast model uh, and based with uh, the, together with the information that comes from uh, if you like the normal weather forecast you know when you watch BBC News and you say mm. oh, it's going to be raining here it's all essentially coming from more or less the same computer model but that's that's all plugged into this this specialized road model and that then is processed so that our main roads are color coded to show whether there's going to be a likelihood of ice, snow, um, rain, uh, whether the temperature is going to be uh, at risk of dipping slightly and then coming back, whether there's going to be hoar frost. And we've got all these different, all these different weather and uh, uh, weather conditions that will affect the roads are, are, are shown on a on my road officers, my duty officers screen. And, and that allows a fairly accurate forecast to be made across the whole of the road network. In addition to that, we've then got almost like smaller, if you like, ice sensors that, that, that just give us um, the uh, the level of the salt uh, on the road surface and the temperature and and they aren't used to plug into this this big mathematical model but they are used by my road officers to make a judgment call on whether we should be sending the gritter out or whether there's enough salt left on the road from the previous action and all this information arrives at my duty officers desk at noon each day and they have to go through the whole of this i mean there's there's maybe about 20 or 30 different roads each with their own forecast across ross and cromarty oh. and and on the basis of those roads we will then uh, come up with a plan for east ross and cromarty which includes the black Isle. And um, it's all about managing that information, understanding mm. it and managing it. Once we put, once we make that action plan, that goes out about lunchtime. It goes to our crews, uh, well, Green Hill Depot for, for, the, for the Black Isle. And we start preparing for the evening pre-grid, if there's going to be one. Uh, we also plan ahead for the morning action as well, the following morning. But then at about six o'clock, we, we can get an evening update from our uh, our, our forecaster. Um, 
and 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 it, it is a forecast. So they they employ this high confidence and low confidence. So um, that allows my duty officers to sort of like hedge their bets a little bit. Um, and then in the morning, there's also another update that comes in about six o'clock in the morning. So that allows us to either cancel or to ramp up the winter treatment, depending on, on what's happening. Um, so that's kind of a snapshot um, of of uh, of our forecasting, um, and it, it's it, to, to be honest, there's an incredible amount of information that my duty officers have to try to collate and then formulate a plan, which you then you see on the ground. So then you'd share that, wouldn't you, with you know education and see if the bus, school bus buses. I mean, it's the use of data to to create more efficiencies in in the system, isn't it? Yes. Yes. And that shared. That would be a fascinating. I mean, I could almost feel you could go into a geography class in school and give this talk. It would be they'd be absolutely with graphics. They'd be yeah. fascinating. You'd inspire quite a lot of young people to to yeah. do go into this line of work. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Right. The amount of work that goes into it is really, really good to hear and actually good for people to know, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. And obviously everything has risks and you can't get it, you know, sometimes you get it wrong, but you're going to get it right more often, aren't you, using I mean, in, yeah, this I, method? I think, yeah, I, I think, I mean, um, the amount of data we've got, uh, it, it's far more accurate than when I first started doing the forecasting and um, back in 97. I mean, um, then it was a text description and that was it you know, a one page summary. Um, whereas now we can see um, route by route mm. where the problems can be expected. And within that, for each route, we can see hour by hour what problems are forecasted, you know. So it's, it, it is very, it's much easier, but it's trying to manage that to process all that information, mm. you know, as well. Thank you, that's very illuminating. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Marvin Mead, do you have questions for Ian? Yes, just just the one. You've answered the, the other question I had, and I just wanted to thank you for that information because that was really fascinating. Um, and the amount of admiration I have for the people who are out doing those jobs is just huge because I can't imagine how hard it is. Um, so my, my question was actually on the staffing levels and I was just wondering, are all the current positions filled or do we have any vacancies that we're looking to fill at the moment? Yeah, um, we, we always seem to have vacancies across um, our, our various road steppers. I mean, um, uh, I, I, I believe there's, there's one vacancy at Greenhill at present. Our, our workforce are getting older. The age is, is increasing. That brings with it uh, uh, more illness, more sickness that we have to carry. Um, we we still have a bit of flexibility in the sense that um, uh, Laura can also call on um, uh, Gary Urquhart, who runs the tea and the tea and all their depots. So there's a bit of flexibility that we can we can move things about uh, to try to cover the most essential routes to make sure they're done first. Um, mm. But um, it's it's always that 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 same problem. There's always one or two vacancies, and we always fill them, and then somebody else goes. You know, so it's it's always that. It's it's it, it never seems to finish. You know that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much for that and thank you for your report. So really appreciate your time today, Ian. And um, are we all happy to approve the winter service plan for 23-24? Yes. yes, yes. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time, Ian. <laughs> Not at thank all. Thanks you. for much, Councillors. Thank you. Have a good Bye. day. Bye. So we are moving on now to item number eight, which is the Common Goods Fund. Um, 
but I'd like to take a wee pause here um, specifically um, to say how much we appreciate the effort that Diagony has put into everything over all the many years that she's worked at the council and um, how much we're all going to miss her now in her retirement and to thank her for doing the, the Common Good Report for this meeting even though it was after her, her finishing time um, but I know if um, Di's watching we would all very much say how much we miss her and how much we appreciate her hard work um, I, I see that more for me. Were you wanting to say anything at that point? I just say it's very typical of Di that she's moonlighting from her retirement already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I just she's... hope she has a. I just hope she has a really enjoyable and relaxing and and selfish retirement after all her hard years of service. Yeah, she'll be very deeply missed. And... Yeah, we're still not the same without her, but she's uh, she's an incredible lady. We're very lucky to have her for as long as we did. And and Helen, we're also very lucky to have you looking after us in the meantime. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, um, are, are you wanting to say anything to the the report that I put together? Um, I mean, first of all, um, I'm very happy to pass on the, the comments you've made about Di too, because I do have her on my personal mobile, because I've also worked with her for, <laughs> for a very long time, I have to say, back to the Ross and Cromarty district days. Um, and I obviously spent a bit of time with her before she left, trying to empty her brains about the common good, because I knew I was going to be covering it for a little while. So, um, But yeah, in, in terms of the, re the report itself, the Cromarty one first, of course, I mean, broadly speaking, it's a standard monitoring one report and, and we're expecting expenditure to be on budget. But obviously the most significant paragraph, I, I guess, for members is paragraph four um, in terms of that review of the assets. Um, and it's obviously transpired through the work that Sarah Murdoch's done. And I know that she's she's here on the call in case there's any questions that, that actually the Victoria Hall is not held on the common good. It's a it, it's a trust and therefore held by the council. So that obviously will have an impact in terms of where that income goes. Um, again, I I, I'm, I presume members have had some some pre briefing on that, but that's you know that's very much the standout paragraph in the report in terms of something that is not business as usual, and obviously will have an impact. Um, but either myself or Sarah will answer any questions um, if we're able to. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I mean, to be honest, my question was mainly about the Victoria Hall and how that's going to look for the hall going forward, because I know it's been um, essentially run by the Community Council and, and just how this change in the register is really going to have implications for the Community Council, for the community and the Common Good Fund, I think is probably where my main concerns would lie. Do you want to come in on the details, Sarah? I'm, I mean, certainly in terms of, of actually the hall, of course, hasn't changed. And I don't, as I, you know, nobody's sort of stopping the activities. So as, to my understanding, the, the most significant impact is for the common good because the income that used to come into it is not appropriate for it to go there anymore. Um, you know, in, in other areas where we're, we're discovering things that have been run and managed by the council and, and they turn out that they are common good. And this is all Sarah has probably spent an awful lot of time in sort of dusty rooms looking at old bits of paper. And mostly it's been that way around. But obviously um, Sarah finds the paperwork and we, we, we have to go where that takes us. But uh, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, Sarah? certainly. Morning, members. Um, yeah, that is the case. When we, as I explained in, in paragraph four, when we went out to the initial consultation, we were receiving quite a bit of pressure from one area in particular to start sort of the consultation bang as soon as the community empowerment section came into force. Um, and we weren't required. It was one of the conditions we weren't required to reinvestigate everything from scratch. And I think if we had been required to do that, we would probably have only just been getting around to running the consultations now, if you think of the size of, of some of the ones, I, particularly like um, Inverness. So it was very much a case of go with what we thought we knew. Um, if we had robust reasons for, for that, which we did, because that's what I'd always been told was that's what the assets were on the common good registers across Highland and see if anyone raised any questions. Um, and there wasn't as many questions raised on most of the areas as I thought there might be. So now, as I'm take, being able to take the time to review the registers, part of what I want to do as as firming up 
the asset registers and forming a legacy moving forward um, is to note down the title deed information on the asset registers themselves. So if anyone comes at any point in the future, um, so if I, I'm no longer working for the council, they can see exactly what the, the title is um, for any of the common good assets. Um, and obviously now, uh, and where any of the title documents may be held, because I'm building a spreadsheet for a database for that. Um, but obviously it's when something like this happens that we realise that there's the anomaly and it's it's easy to understand how it's happened historically. Um, in many respects, there's a great deal of similarities between trust and common good property. Um, but when the borough councils were abolished, those two properties passed were vested separately. They are subject to separate um, statutory requirements. Um, there's no statutory definition of common good, so we have to look at case law and it's case law very much on what is what we base this on, um, that if property is held on a special trust, trust or is acquired um, under statutory powers by a local authority, it can't be common good. Anything else, if they weren't acquired in those ways, then they can be common good. So it's unfortunate, but the deed is extremely clear. Um, now, the council holds a number of um, trusts, both charitable trusts, which tend to come under the charity umbrellas. Um, and in fact, I see that you've got a report before you later this morning, members, on uh, the Ross and Cromarty educational trusts. Um, and that that is one of the, the ones that falls under the charitable trust, one of the umbrella um, charities that the council manages, but they also hold um, a considerable number of um, trust funds that are, were not formally charities and are known as public trusts. And this is where this one would now sit. Ultimately, all members, in the same way as Common Good, all members are trustees of those trusts. And in the same way as Common Good, um, there's a delegation that delegates the, the management down to area committee for the trusts in those areas. So you're still going to be very much involved with this particular trust fund for Cromarty. Um, I will say that perhaps the trusts generally, although you've got Helen here helping you at the moment, and she was very efficient in reorganising her trusts in, in the Tain and Invergordon area, but generally they they sort of get a little bit overlooked. So this is perhaps a good one. It, it will always be in the back of your mind, I think, because it was formerly Common Good and it was very easy to manage them in with Common Good. But we now we have to be very much aware that they're not the same property. Ultimately, as with common good, the council can come to an arrangement with the community council, whether that's some form of lease arrangement, agreement or whatever it is for carrying on exactly as normal. There's, nothing's really physically changed. The council is responsible for these properties. It's just now that it's managed under a slightly different heading. I'm if there's any money that's received by way of rent or, or income from that, technically it would come into um, the trust fund side of financial um, accounting for the for your area. And that's the sort of thing that Lara and her colleagues, Lara Harrison and her colleagues would move to a different account. Any of the money received um, tends for trust properties to be focused on supporting um, and maintaining those properties that the trust it's for um, maintaining the the capital of the trust if, if you see what I mean um, so if there was anything that Victoria Hall needed then the income would be looked to be used for that um, so there shouldn't really be any effect as far as the community council is concerned they're not going to suddenly find themselves um, being dealt with any differently um, but, there's very little. It's really just for yourselves as members to know um, the difference in the way that the property is held. And obviously, as Helen has mentioned, it will no longer feature as income as far as the common good is concerned. Um, but yes, the, you know, the, there are a number across the area that we're finding some anomalies in both directions, mostly, as Helen says, in, in the other direction. Um, and, and it came about very much because historically properties tended to take their ownership, as it were, via service users rather than anything else. And we're now going back to the title deeds, which is obviously what we have to base it on. Um, but yeah, happy to take any questions. I know it might seem like a bit of a strange thing suddenly to find yourselves confronted with, but you know, it, it is the situation as it stands moving forward. 
Oh, thank you so much for all that information, because obviously it's it's this is all new for us as well, and I really appreciate the the detail to which you've gone um, into explaining that. Um, Marvin May, did you have questions surrounding this particular topic? Yes, I just had the sort of one question, and that was uh, a query over whether or not the community felt strongly enough that they wanted to contest this. Is that something that they could do, or is this something that's non-negotiable? There isn't really a, a forum to contest it. I mean, we base our um, view on this from case law. Um, when statutes come in, they come in in quite a general format and, and give you duties and responsibilities and information. They then get firmed up by secondary legislation, such as statutory instruments and guidance. But the specifics of how you manage things from statute is then dealt with in case law. So, as I mentioned, there's no direct um, definition of common goods. So um, in the 19 in 1944, there was a case that the big query was, was it common good property or was it trust property? So this specific case, and, and it doesn't matter that the circumstances of the case are not directly identical. It's the principles then that get established as a result of case law. And it was this one that said that you know, if you held trust property, you held, hold it in a different way to holding common good property. You hold it under trust legislation. Um, and same for any property acquired for the statutory purposes of the borough. So they said very clearly in one of what it was Lord Walk in what his judgment was that all property of a royal borough or a borough of barony not acquired under statutory powers or held under special trusts forms part of the common good. Um, so that's why we go back to the title deeds. This is held on a trust. So therefore, what we're saying is if it's held on a trust, it couldn't form common good. So it might be difficult for the community to understand, um, but there isn't really a format for saying, well, actually, in this case, we don't agree with you because this is applied across the board. You know, there's a number of cases that we've having to apply this to, either that it's trust property. And believe me, I would rather it was common good than trust, because if you need to change anything with trust property and it's a major change, it's an expensive process. Whereas we have statutory processes in place for common good that we can do things with a lot easier. So. I, I try and avoid trust if I can, um, but unfortunately, when the document says it quite clearly, we don't really have a choice. So I think they just need to understand that effectively it's still property that the council needs to protect because the council has um, responsibilities now as trustees for that property. Um, yeah, so they have very clear responsibilities as trustees to protect that property in, in a similar way as they have responsibilities as custodians of the common good to to protect and, and preserve the common good property. So they're similar trustees, uh, similar powers and responsibilities, sorry, but they are covered by very different statutory procedures. Okay, thank you very much for that. And thank you for, for the detail that you went into with your report, because it was absolutely fascinating reading it, the history of it. It was, it was really brilliant. So thank you for that. Sina, is it the right time to ask? I was just wanting to ask about East Hall in Cromarty. Couple of questions. East Hall in Cromarty, if there's any update on that, because it's it's so sad that it's just not I don't think it's been used, is it? It used to be I don't such a, think it is. I think is there not some I'm trying to remember back. It, I know I got copied into some correspondence, I think, that Di was sending. Was I think was there was the, interest in a in a cat. Yeah, and I think there was some issue about them needing to get it to a certain standard for access. Did not the the people that were interested in using it as a cat want to hold some sort of community session or something in there? And the last I heard, and this Di may well have mentioned something more to Helen, but the last I heard was they were looking whether they could get the hall into a suitable condition to be able to hold that forum, you know, that say community meetings. But I'm I haven't been involved in but anything I think, further than I, that. Yeah, I thought that was a little while ago and that didn't mm. transpire. I mean, the thing is, it's a it is a common good asset at the moment. Yes, and it's it is. just it is lying, you know, in decline. And it could generate income. It's the whole argument, isn't it? Of what are we doing with these properties if they're just not put to good use. And the sec my second question is on 5.2. I mean, at the moment, interest rates are 
this is not obviously not might not be within your control anyway but just to know that interest rates are incredibly high and are these high interest rates being passed on to <laughs> savings and investments or because we would hope wouldn't we that actually we could be getting a little bit more interest on Lara Lara Harrison and her team would be the appropriate the finance yeah. team would be the appropriate um people to advise on that um it, Income tends to be held, I think it's it's in certain accounts by the for the council. So my understanding would be that in general it should benefit from a higher rate of interest. Um, but the specifics of that fall directly within Lara's um information. Thank you. So she if you need it, I'm sure that they would be happy to give some explanation of that to you, members, if you wish to ask for it. Sorry, Helen. Are you wanting to come back in? I was just going to suggest on that point that we we take an action to um ask ask Lara to have have a look at that and come back with whatever information she's able to. That'd be fantastic. I, I could perhaps also just add on that we, we do have a number of pools where um they're not in the great condition and they don't have big balances. I mean I'm I've been very long time involved in the Gordon and it you know it's it's similar it's it's usable but there's a lot of things need done to it and it has small reserves and almost no income. Um, and, and, you know, over the years I have looked at, I've applied for regeneration capital grant funding, but of course, if you haven't got a real purpose that it's being used for, it, it tends to lose out. And at the moment it is subject to a cat and the lo a local group is trying to take it forward. And that may well be the most positive um, way forward. Um, but, but obviously it has to be something that really works for the local group because otherwise it's not it's not going to work for them. And the last thing we want to do is to pass on a hall to a group that actually isn't going to manage to run it and, and they're mm. going to struggle and be you know disillusioned and it won't improve the hall either. So it's they're quite challenging some of these. And I, I think sometimes it's just, you know, at a moment in time, sometimes a, a group comes forward, a use comes out and, and suddenly you're on a more positive path, but it's quite challenging. I think we can we can all safely say that Cromarty has a great track record of making things happen. You know, they are just tremendously motivated when they when they are motivated that the sky seems to be no, there's no limit. So, I mean, I'd have quite a lot of confidence that they would make something of it if, if given the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Fantastic. Thank you so much, both of you. Really appreciate your time today and all the work that's going on in the background here. It's it's a massive piece of work, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. I don't think I'm involved with anything else, so thank you very much. <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so um, we're moving on to number nine, which is the Ross and Cromarty Educational Trust Reports. Um, sorry, Helen. Um, the, there's the Full Trust and Rose Market Common Good. Is oh, that my goodness, yes. Agenda? <laughs> that's why I'm lurking. No, <laughs> oh, you're quite right. Ed, complete... I was I, so busy that's what, that was on. my interest rate. That was actually my question on the interest rate was from 5.2 was from the, the B was from Full Trust and Rose Market. Oh, so yes. <laughs> Sorry, I've jumped the gun now. We're all jumping the gun. I think we're we're keen to rattle through, aren't we? <laughs> okay, yes. So, um, going back to part B of number eight, then, um, <laughs> if you want to give us the rundown on that one, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this one I don't really have anything to add because you know it is it's the quarter one monitoring, and we're still expecting everything at the end of the year to be on budget, um, and that you know there hasn't been any specific changes or or, or information. So, um, yeah, no, nothing to add on this one. I and mean, if you have any questions, I'll take them away because I I have picked nice brains, but it takes a little while to really get up to speed on them, of course. Um, I don't have any questions on this one. Um. Um, do you do yourself, Marvin, me or Sarah, want to come in with anything here? I don't have anything for this one. I, I, I mean, obviously, asked my question in the wrong section, but I mean, it's relevant. <laughs> it's relevant. It is relevant to all of it. I mean, but this the com. It's a thing of you know the rental income. In my opinion is incredible. Is very low for for the assets, but I think that's a a much wider debate and discussion. 
um, mm -hmm. to be had at ward level and beyond me possibly not for possibly not for today but so thanks for for you know the work that's um that's gone into the report thanks very much and and yeah we do our property colleagues do review the rents um on a normally it's a three-year basis i imagine this would be the same um and I, we could ask them. I mean, it might be appropriate if you wanted a bit more to invite them to, to a wood business meeting, perhaps, and they can give you a little bit more of the detail about how they come to their conclusions. Yeah, I yeah, think, I think that, that it would be useful up, a business it? meeting. Yeah, mm. yeah, definitely. Thanks, Helen. Well, thank, thank you. you so much, Helen. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye. So we're moving on then to number nine. So welcome Derek, thank you for coming along this morning. Um, so we've we've had a chance to to read the report on the, the Educational Trust, so um, over to you. Yes, good morning Chair, morning members and thanks for the opportunity this morning. <coughs> so the Ross and Cromarty uh, Educational Trust, by way of reminder, covers not just Ross and Cromarty, but it also covers the Western Isles. Uh, as well as a former county of Rosshire. Um, and so you'll see um, reference made to uh, Ancurla uh, with regards to some expenditure there. Perhaps if I take you to section four of uh, the report, you can see 4.1. There's a not insignificant amount there of about three quarters of a million pounds. Uh, held uh, by uh, the Highland Council on the trustees' behalf. Um, but you can see the income is, is only nine and a bit thousand pounds, which is, is reasonably disappointing. At times in the past, it's, it's you know maybe 15 to 20 thousand, somewhere in that bracket, but it reflects the, the ongoing uh, economic climate. Interestingly enough, had it been simply in a deposit bank account, uh, like the Dunkraig Trust is, um, at, uh, the, with interest rates going up, um, you get uh, a bigger return at the moment. And so one of the things to consider uh, going forward, and there's a request in the report to delegate that to the Area Education and Learning Manager uh, to you know, continue to look at, you know, the, the best forms of a uh, investment. 4.2 gives you an indication of uh, the awards that have been given out, where it says, for example, EM, uh, that's just to protect uh, the, uh, the, the rights of an individual. Of course, I can disclose that to you individually, but not in an overall uh, report. Um, and I guess the ones that you're particularly interested in uh, will be the ones around uh, the Black Isle. The Rose Hawk Bursary, you'll see from the, the appendix, um, is a significant uh, amount of money that can be awarded. Now, bear in mind, that's the maximum that can be awarded in a year, but that's obviously subject to investment income. And so generally what I do with that and calculating amounts for your approval is I look at the overall maximum amounts and then measure that against the total income and work out a percentage uh, so that it's equitable across all the different little bits of the of the trust. But you can see there, for example, there are uh, two young people who benefited from a thousand pounds, as you will recall. That's a significant amount and that's great to see uh, that money now being used for its original intended purpose. Uh, the Kenneth Murray one, as I recall, I think that's over Cromarty Way, £800. That's a, you know, again, it makes a, it's a nice wee boost to someone who's maybe going into a college or university. Uh, and then some smaller amounts uh, around that. Uh, you can see there at the bottom bullet point that the Western Isles Council has received just over £5,000, and that's delegated uh, to that local authority to use in a similar vein. There's prizes to go out, um, then there's bursaries to go out, 
and then any other income that, uh, that's available um, for the last uh, schedule is for uh, distribution for usually schools applying for a bit of sports money or something like that. So you can see in 4.3, it gives you uh, that uh, kind of pecking order. Uh, the prize funds to the schools are, are interestingly not, not as, as large as some of the bursary grants, but they have a higher priority, so they must go out uh, uh, each year as a priority, then the bursaries and then other bits and bobs. Um, the other bits and bobs one, which is quite an important one, you know, schools used to uh, apply for a bit of money for, you know, a sports trip or something like that. Um, but uh, what happened in uh, a number of years ago was that it was actually that that was prioritised rather than the prizes and the bursaries, and that was not in line with the, uh, I think it was the 1961 Act uh, around it. Somehow in the past it had been reversed around, and um, we don't really know why, but uh, uh, we had to bring it back in line. The unfortunate bit is unless you get um, more than a 100 percent income against prizes and bursaries, that means there's virtually no money left for uh, those little bits, which is a, a real shame in a way. But um, we can't do anything about that because we can't reprioritize the uh, that to the top. Um, you can see in the appendices. Um, that the highlighted ones in yellow are the ones that affect mid area. And of course, within that, you'll see ones that will be will be of particular interest to you. And you can see that uh, in 1961, we refer to uh, two pounds, 10 shillings and, uh, and a small dog. Uh, and we had to do a conversion exercise a couple of years ago uh, and we were quite surprised when you actually try and work it out that uh, what two pounds and ten shillings is worth today, uh, sitting there at what fifty pounds or thereabouts. Um, so that gives you the original values under the Act and um, and the calculations um, for for today's. Now sometimes you'll see references to schools that no longer exist, and I think there's one in. Um, in the Black Elk Committee area. I'm trying to see where it is. Is it Colleen? Yeah, I think mm. it's Colleen, you're right. And so what we do there is we simply look at, well, where is that catchment area today? Um, and apply it uh, and apply it that way. So I'm happy, of course, to take any any questions and ask that the committee note uh, the report and uh, agree uh, to the continued delegated authority to look at changes of investment uh, if if we're advised by the finance people. So happy to take questions, Chair. Thank you so much for that. And um, uh, my question is around, uh, I take it this is one of these parts of the job that uh, gives you a little bit of joy now and then, because who doesn't li yeah. love handing out a little bit of fairy dust to make yes, things um, a wee bit nice? And I suspect also for members who are actually the trustees, I'm merely your servant in this regard. Um, yes, isn't it nice that um, it's it's a fund that cannot be touched for any other purpose? And so even if the income isn't terrific in any given year, it's still a little something that uh, can make a difference to to young people's lives. And and yes, it is nice, isn't it? You know and. Uh, um, yeah, it's lovely. And it's nice to see, you know, the original benefactors such as uh, Rose Hoch back in the day. It's not the Rose Hoch of today, but it's back in the day who, who so generously set something up uh, for, for for forever. You know, it's, it's lovely to see. And it's lovely to see names um, from our local area that obviously go down in history as well, isn't it? And yes, yes. And that. And very important, but um, obviously some of those grants were lovely and, and will have made a big difference to people given their size. So have you had any um, feedback from the grant recipients? Um, I've, I've often been asked this by uh, different committees because it's no one committee that decide on, on it in the round. Um, 
so we get some anecdotal things back and where it's a repeating bursary, we, we do ask for, um, you know, an indication, uh, but not much more. You know, are they still on the course? Are they still doing OK? Um, because once you issue a bursary, in theory, it could exist for four years for that person. Each year they have the automatic right, should there be any money, uh, to receive that continued bursary throughout the duration of their course. We did have a, a query from someone saying, you know, I heard that someone got this money last year. Is it not better that somebody else gets a shot this year? We had to explain that, um, uh, you know, we, we have no discretion in the matter. Once you issue a bursary, then it's for the duration of that course, uh, usually uh, four years. And then, in effect, it, it gets opened uh, out again. So for some of the bursaries that are recurring, um, you know, that that will make a huge difference over the, the, the length of, uh, of the course. Um, so we get some anecdotal bits and bobs um, uh, back in, but we don't seek from individuals, you know, formal written reports uh, and so on, uh, but rather an indication really to help us gauge are they entitled to receive the bursary again, you know, next year. Occasionally we do get uh, a nice email, I have to say not that often, uh, from people saying, you know, first of all, thank you so much. You know, it's lifted my heart. It's made a bit of a difference. Uh, and occasionally, um, you know, th something from from someone just saying thank you at the end of the year. Um, so uh, whilst not insisted upon, it's nice when young people just make that little bit of an effort. It's also nice when young people make an effort with their application. Sometimes we get um, everything from just the bare bones, I want this amount of money, to um, sometimes uh, uh, a lengthy explanation about their own circumstances. And you know yourself, the more information that people volunteer, the easier it is to gauge where the, the difference can be made. Now, a good example of that would be um, prior to uh, your elections, uh, as I recall, uh, at the height of COVID or the start of COVID, um, we had no income in effect. Um, everything pancaked. Um, and uh, the, the, I spoke to senior members um, around Ross and Cromarty of the time and, uh, and also my own uh, executive chief officer to release some emergency funding from the education budget uh, within the area uh, to parachute it into the trust so that um, it could help um, some very needy young people. And that could only be a one off because it wasn't strictly speaking trust money, but you know, it, it was useful for members to be able to say that, that this was uh, going out in their name. And that was a dreadful time, which is why we looked to find something from somewhere. I think we managed to find £25,000 that year um, because we were hearing tales of people going to um, start university whose parents' businesses had failed. Um, parents, who, parents who were unemployed and would have struggled anyway. And with the COVID situation getting, for example, regular food deliveries, they had nothing left. For their, their children who are wanting to fly. Um, and so that was very rewarding that um, whilst not strictly trust money, it followed the principle of what can we do to help young people in our community. And some of the notes we got back from that were, were very inspiring at the time. Uh, so I think people do, do appreciate uh, uh, th those, those amounts, so that's nice. Oh no, that's really, really fantastic, and really, actually, it's lovely to have a a really nice item to end the the, it the is. committee. It on. is, yes, yes. Um, but yes, yeah, so I take it we are all happy with the content of the report and happy to delegate authority to the area education and learning manager to explore options around improved investment income. Yes. Great stuff. Thank you. Yes, fantastic. definitely. And thank you again for managing this and um, being able to sprinkle the fairy dust. It's 
Well, very much I'm, appreciated. In, in this case, I'm merely your servant. You are the trustees collectively as uh, uh, elected members across uh, Ross and Cromarty. Um, but yes, it's a it's a nice thing to do. So <laughs> thank you. Fantastic. And thank thanks you for your time much. today, Derek. Thank you. Thank folks. you. Have a good day. Bye. And <laughs> thank bye. you. Take care. Then it looks to be the last item on our agenda today is to approve the minutes from January. So are we happy to approve those minutes? Yep. Yeah, that's fine. By Great. Me. Okay. Brilliant. Well, that appears to be us. So thank you all very much for your time today. And um really appreciate the time that everybody's taken for the reports. And um thank you very much.